Few places in the world have a reputation as mysterious as Timbuktu. It's a fabled place synonymous with remoteness and myth. What do I know about Timbuktu? It's a saying for a start. Don't know anything about Timbuktu at all. Don't even know where it is, can't tell you. I know it's in eastern Russia, I think. I've never heard of it. It's a place in the United States of America, I don't know where exactly, that is featured in some old westerns with John Wayne and people like that. Somewhere about there. But the people of Hay on Wye know exactly where Timbuktu is. In 2007, the small Welsh border town, renowned for its bookshops and literary festival, was chosen over 52 other British towns to twin with Timbuktu, the ancient city in Mali on the edge of the Sahara Desert in Africa. The two places may be thousands of miles apart, but they are connected by the one thing that has shaped civilization: literature. Four teenagers are embarking on a journey of a lifetime to visit their twin town, two and a half thousand miles away. This is also their first step into the world of the writer. From now on, they must start to live and think as writers do, to see and feel what's around them, gathering thoughts and reflections. This is not your average school trip. This is an exploration into the unknown, a perilous journey to a harsh and dangerous place. Young Welsh feet making footprints in a distant land. In October 2008, the twinning between Timbuktu and Hay on Wye was taken one step further. Ten aspiring writers from the local comprehensive Gwernabed High School auditioned for a life-changing opportunity, a chance to make the epic journey to the fabled town of Timbuktu. So, if you're communicating... The youngsters had to complete writing tasks, endure screen tests, think creatively, and be challenged by the published author, Tom Bullo. The process was not easy, but neither was the adventure that lay ahead. Only four could be chosen for their ultimate challenge, to write about their experience in Africa to a standard high enough to impress Tom. So that's, that's, that's what I like. After three arduous days of selection, the final four were chosen. They will make the journey from Hay to Timbuktu. I was told by uh, the head teacher, he yeah, just sat us down and just, just said that I was chosen. And I came out just screaming when he said it was me. I was just like, ah! I got the email and I, I was just like running around the house, I was running around to my aunt's house, I was running to the neighbours. Usually I feel quite confident about things, but about the whole um, audition process with this. Didn't even imagine I was going, I just, there was no chance. Throughout the journey, Tom will work with the young writers via the internet to hone their skills and help them bring their ideas alive. He'll give them support and advice on how to succeed in their quest and make them into truly creative writers. Genuine about. So, for example, if, if you find something really funny, genuinely funny, and that grabs you as funny, and if um, you might feel strongly about that. And so this is, this is, this is, this is what I mean about, sort of about, about sincerity. My role is really as a creative writing mentor. Um, Essentially, I'm here to try and sharpen up their skills and help them put across their enthusiasm for the project on the page in a way that can be understood by everybody else. Say so you're interested in clothes, you know, what, what clothes are they wearing? Do you like the clothes? You know? I can identify with these kids because I grew up around here myself. I'm, I'm from a sort of farming background and I've been a 17-year-old aspiring writer as well, and I, I know what it's like, and I know the pitfalls very, very well indeed. The standard problem that you get with writers of this age is overwriting. But what I'm hoping to do is to help them find their own strengths as writers, what you call their own voices. The youngsters only have three months to prepare for their first job as travel writers. Their journey to sub-Saharan Africa should not be taken lightly, as many have fallen by the wayside trying to get there.
The only boy in the group, Ollie, lives on a farm in the hills north of Hay. He is quiet and understated, the reserved one, unless he is behind a musical instrument when he transforms. OK, um, well, I'm not exactly sure about what instrument to take um, to Timbuktu because I'd quite like to take my banjo. I've heard that there's a, a similar instrument to the banjo in, in Mali. I played a classical guitar for uh, about eight years now, so I'd quite like to go over there and, and learn, some, learn some new skills. And, uh, and yeah, just um, take, take back some, some of the music they play over there. And I'm doing, uh, I'm doing English for AS levels, so it'll help my creative writing a lot. And I never really kept a diary before, so to be honest, it'll, it'll, it'll be a challenge, but it'll be, it'll be worth it. It'll be something to be proud of when I've finished. I think it would be, the, apart from that, just rad radically, radically different, just writing, a, writing about Timbuktu and, um, and a culture that's, that seems so alien. It's not just a different culture. They must pack for a debilitating 40 degree heat. Bought these on Thursday at four inches, four or five inches of snow, and I'm buying sandals. Ollie's friends say he's quite shy in company, but hopefully his passion for music and writing will help him engage with a new culture. Meanwhile, down in Brecon, 16 year old Laura is a keen writer and filmmaker. Inside her bedroom, she makes her own animations, faking worlds of B movies and sci fi. My God, looks like it's crash landed. But Laura's friends say she inhabits a very real world of fixed opinions with a touch of cynicism. I think I'll be um, writing what I think most of the time, just sort of whatever comes to mind and write it down before I forget it, <laughs> because that's what I tend to do. Everything out there is going to be a complete culture shock and I just want to see how I react. That sounds stupid, but <laughs> I just want to see everything out there is completely alien. There are some things she won't want to see. Yellow fever, malaria, typhoid and rabies are all very present threats for which inoculation is a necessity. Already a keen writer, a venture scout and an outdoor pursuit enthusiast, the third in the group is organised, bright and practical. Hi Nelly, and it's time to start packing for Timbuktu. Well, I've had a total of seven injections and malarone tablets already. I've got one more injection to go, which I'm going to have right before we go, but otherwise I'm all set. Above all, she's conscientious and has been reading up about dress codes for women in Islamic countries. Well, I knew I had to pack for hot conditions, but you obviously have to think about the religion and everything, and you've got to be respectful. So I've had to think... No trousers, no, no shorts, no short sleeves, no bikinis. <laughs> the writing obviously is going to play a big part in this and I've been trying to think about what to include and what would interest people in reading it. I'm a little nervous because obviously this is beyond just a high school essay. People are going to be reading this and I want to do the very best I can and just to make the whole trip feel alive for everyone else. Already. Emma, I'm 17 and I've lived here for pretty much most of my life. Emma is a farm girl. She's as natural with people as she is with her animals, but tough, strong and at ease with the world. Everyone keeps asking me if I'm nervous, but I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, I actually can't wait. It's so like odd to think that I'm going to be in sand next week, not snow. and Yeah, really, really looking forward to it. It's, it's not a normal experience. So. <laughs> I've seen a lot of pictures of the people. I really don't know how, how different they're going to be. I don't really have any clue, apart from the, the pictures that I've seen, so I'm quite intrigued to know, like, you know, how modern they are or, like, how up-to-date they are for music and everything like that. I'm just I'm quite excited to find that out. Perhaps as a people person, Emma might find it easier to talk than write, even in French-speaking Mali. The four are following in the footsteps of 18th century European explorers and writers. But their literary pilgrimage involves two flights, from the UK to Paris, then on to the Malian capital Bamako, followed by a three-day drive with overnights in the remote towns of Djenne and Duenza, and then finally onto the fabled city of Timbuktu. A total of two and a half thousand miles over four days. It's Friday the 13th of February, but these four young writers are far from unlucky. 
they are on the start of a journey taking them to the very heart of the written word in Africa. It'll be a long day of check-ins, queues and delays, and all the while they are waiting for the first glimpse of a different continent and culture. Some 14 hours later, at night, they land in Bamako, tired and confused. It's too dark to see this strange new land. Exhausted, they head straight for the hotel to sleep. Africa will have to wait until morning. At dawn, they're up and looking at their new world, reflecting on the events from the previous day and night. It was like that heat. You know, like when yeah. you meet an old friend, it just like rushed up yeah. to embrace you. It's like, oh, you're here, you're in Africa. <laughs> yeah. So different to where we were yesterday. On a bus little to bus. <laughs> in murky. It um, really is crazy, and now we're here. So I have to say, this river's a lot wider than the Y. <laughs> the river Y looks a bit boring in comparison, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> They've got much wider boats. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. I'm shocked because I, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but this is really shocking. That is amazing. I want to stay here. <laughs> There's a lot of big contrast from what it was like last night. It's very peaceful now. So, yeah. You know, I didn't expect this, so now I really don't know what to expect anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to go with the flow. They will literally go with the flow, as it is the same river, the Niger, that links Bamako with Timbuktu. But for now, they travel by road on a gruelling three-day overland journey. There's inspiration to write everywhere they look. like a film you just you see things flying by and after a while you just get into sort of a trance like state and you know the heat kind of lulls you and the sound of the engine and you know you just stare you're not entirely awake but you're not asleep either it's this weird state of consciousness of just being and watching things you know you're going somewhere but you're not entirely in the place either <laughs> We've been in the Jeep for about four or five hours now. I don't know how far we've travelled. It's just because it's just been endless road after road and then villages and it's just so hard to tell. Where are we now? <laughs> after a long, hot drive, they stop for a short break and experience a different pace of life on the river. <gasps> oh my God. What is that? That is so random. Oh my God. <laughs> Why do they have crocodiles? <laughs> Is it on the menu? He does just look like a handbag. A handbag? <laughs> really yeah. Much as they would love to stay and savour the calm of the water, there's no time to linger, as it's still 205 miles to Jenne, tonight's destination. The Niger here is a delta, so one minute you're in the desert, the next you're crossing water. Outside, the landscape flickered by, all perception of time forgotten, any green coated in a thin layer of dust, leeching away all primary colours, leaving only pastel shades. I was left in shock by this fantastically different world. The great dry plains with their scrub and thorny trees, the burning light, the flamboyant people in their wildly coloured clothes, 
the crammed market stalls. As sun sets on their first long day of travel, they catch the last ferry to Jenny, the famous ancient mud-built town. The group becomes the only hope for a fresh-faced, die-hard trinket salesman. Good price, best quality, good price. I am Mr. Good Price. Here is the best quality, good price. I am Malian. I come from Mali, you know, in Jenny. In Jenny. And it's amazing. Ten hours on the road, tired and hungry, it's starting to sink in how blessed their lives at home in Wales are. It's just a very different way that people live, and you know you can't help but make comparisons to ourselves and think, God, we have it all and we don't even realise it. Jenne is a World Heritage Site and its mosque is the largest mud-built structure on the planet. Concrete is illegal here. Jenne is seen as a sister city to Timbuktu and they are both connected by the River Niger and its trade routes. The group on a tour of the town are in search of inspiration. Now their thoughts need to become words and those words need to become writing. Their mentor, Tom, suggested they incorporate words in their surroundings. It's, the architecture here is absolutely amazing. Like, the, the fact that they build everything with just, like, natural, like, mud, anything, it's just, it's crazy. Jenne, dust, mud, nothing else. Ancient monuments of ancestors battle with the elements. Everlasting, cracked mud, so fragile. The eyes of history seem to be bearing down on Jenne. Seemingly raised from the earth surrounding, the town is old and tired and lives from the prospers of its former glories, but thrives on its indisputable beauty. In 1996, a French magazine held an inappropriate photo shoot inside the mosque, upsetting the imams. Ever since, it is forbidden for all non-Muslims to enter, so the group has to make do with a view from a nearby terrace. The mud bricks ensure the buildings are cool inside, but outside, there's no escaping from the sun's heat. It is winter and it is unbelievably hot. It's something like 38 degrees. I couldn't imagine anything hotter, really. I just suddenly felt like I was going to fall over, so I just had to sit down and got water on me. <laughs> Ellie is surprised to see so many young children on the streets and not in school as they would be back home. All these kids have to study the Quran and they do that from about six to seven and then very, very few of them get to go to French school after this. And so instead they have to go around and basically make a living for themselves and they're what, three years old. And, but they're just the sweetest little kids and they just love to have their photo taken and just be, well, they like to be filmed like everyone else. <laughs> With so many surfaces to use, they find a creative way to graffiti without causing offence. Because um, you can't, you can't do any graffiti on these. Ones. Made of mud, it's impossible. Yes. Back at home is you lots of graffiti. Good. So that's why I wrote graffiti. At the moment, I'm just trying to sum up my thoughts of this amazing place and you know could I what else could I see today what else is there left to see because I just feel like everything's on odor below my senses and my what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing that's this is really intense <laughs> this is Ollie Laura Emma and Ellie's first proper stop since arriving in Mali and it's a chance to reflect 
It seems as if having time to experience African life has indeed ignited the creative spark. But there's no time to do much with it, as they still have a long drive ahead of them, 175 miles across sun-baked flatlands to Duenza. Everywhere you look, there's just, just just flat, and there's like the odd bush and just grass and sand. This is it's vast. You can see why it used to take people like years to get anywhere. What was it? Timbuktu. It took them 18 months from France. We travelled through the heart of a desert. Time once again had vanished and the isolation of the wilderness was curiously comforting. After another six hot and uncomfortable hours in the jeep, the group reached the end of the tarmac road, the small town of Duenza. From here to Timbuktu, it's all sand. It's been quite a difficult couple of days in terms of um, in the writing because there are so many ideas, it's just getting it all down and you have to do it while it's fresh in your mind. There's so much stuff, it's quite overwhelming. Mali hits you in the face, the heat, the searing heat. You, know, you can smell the dust, you can smell plants and, and it's like, you know, you can suddenly feel sand between your toes and things and you can actually feel like you're in the land and you're like, ooh, this is new. <laughs> As I was sat on the wall, a young boy creeped into the outside restaurant terrace and sat next to me. He wondered what I was holding and as soon as he realised it, what it was, he requested photo, photo. So I took one of him and I showed it to him. He studied the screen and said, wow, I will never forget that. I felt very sad to say goodbye to him knowing that he needed food, water and money. I think that so far this situation has been the hardest to deal with, wanting to help the young begging boys, but knowing that if you give them money, it will only encourage their begging and worsen their lives. Over the course of a journey, I have communicated with many of the young people, and that is the one thing that I will never, ever forget. The long journey is taking its toll. They wake up tired, but inspired. It's a chance to savour the peace of early morning in Mali. Today is the last leg of their journey. Four hours off-road across sand and rock in 40 degree heat. There's a brief moment of calm as they cross the river Niger on ferry. A short drive will see them finally reaching their goal, Timbuktu. There is no end, no respite, only more heat, more dryness, more dehydration. Giant rock features, having survived the ravages of time, loom in the distance. A landscape worn, beaten, isolated, unknown. I saw a camel, an actual camel, it was real. They exist in the wild, they don't just exist in the zoo. In this land of vast distances, speed is crucial to keeping on time, and we have a ferry to catch. The mud roads leave a trail of dust behind them as we cut through this ancient land. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, it's been quite a bumpy ride. We've just done 150 kilometres and it's been about four hours. And it's like speed at Oakwood, but four hours long. We have sand. <laughs> we're in a desert now. I feel like we're finally getting to Timbuktu because we've left all civilization now. We haven't even got a tarmac road, so we're nearing. The sandy roads are left behind. All that remains is a cool one-hour ferry crossing. A welcome break from the confines of the back seat of the Jeep. Look, the Niger, we've made it. <laughs> it feels great because I find you to stretch my legs, breathe some fresh air and you get a nice breeze. Uh, and the scenery is great as well, so uh, I'm pretty excited really. It's the last leg of, it's taken us about three days, so. Three days? Three days and my life feels changed. Yes. <laughs> I just wonder what I'm going to be like. I'm going to be a whole new person by the time I get yeah. home. This kid came up and was shouting, Stilo, Stilo. I was like, what's that? Oh, God, you know in French. Stilo, pen, of course. So I gave him some pens and paper and he was so happy. Over in Britain, pretty much everyone can read and write. And we always take it for granted. And, and, and they don't they even get that opportunity to learn. I wonder what they think of Vaxel Hay. Probably think we're all very spoiled. I wonder what they would say if they came to Wales and then came home. What would they miss more? People tell you all the time, oh, it's going to be really, you know, it's going to, it's going to be really weird out there. It's going to be lots of things you you've never seen. And, and like, yeah, and you see it all on the telly all the time. But yeah. to actually see it, being in the presence of it, it actually really does hit you. And, when, and I think it is beginning to change me, like, my perceptions of things. Timbuktu, here we come. It's an odd place to say you're going, really. I just feel like I was so excited just when we started this trip, but now we're here and it's literally yeah. right around the corner. I just, I, I'm all nerves and excited like again. I'm just, However cheesy that sounds. Uh, I've always wanted to know what people are age like across the other side of the world feel. And it'll be really nice to see what they get up to, what their school's like you know, what privileges they have and don't have, and it, it'll be interesting to find out what differences and similarities we have. Soon they'll get to meet their pen friends at the school. They are just minutes away from Timbuktu. As the Jeep rolls off the ferry into the port of Timbuktu, their two and a half thousand mile journey is almost done. Back on tarmac, racing along, they can barely contain their excitement. Oh, oh my god, there's a sign. Welcome to Timbuktu. Ready, ready, ready. 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 But their adventure doesn't stop here. They're in for a tough week. They'll be pushed to their limits. They must now acclimatize to a new amazing culture, make new friends and see new sights. Learn about the city and above all, write about it. Join Ellie, Emma, Ollie and Laura next time as they continue their African literary journey from Wales to Timbuktu.